My name is Brent Johnson, and in today's training, we're gonna be covering how to read a listing for perimeter fire barrier conditions. This is one of the most complex type of fire stop listings that you're going to be faced with as a reviewer, inspector, or installer. With that, we wanna take a couple steps to make sure you understand how much goes into these listings, where to find the information, and hopefully how to read it more clearly to do your job more efficiently. So today's training brought to you by the International Fire Stop Council is gonna focus on curtain wall or perimeter fire containment uh, fire stop systems. Real quickly, I wanna take one step to show you that you can find listings from laboratories on their websites or the manufacturer's websites. So one of the most popular areas uh, that you might find is Underwriters Laboratory. And as you see on the screen, this is the UL website that you can search for free if you sign up for a free account, those listings. So if you know your listing number, you can type it into the area up here. Please remember that the dashes in the listing need to be specifically put into the uh, box here. If you don't know what you're looking for, your Firestop manufacturer and the laboratories provide you search engines now to help streamline that. Uh, still can be a bit confusing because fire stop listings are so specific and there's a lot to them and there's thousands of them. But again, if you scroll down, you'll see all different types here. And if we go down a little bit further, you're gonna see there's a topic just perimeter fire containment systems. If I click that, it's gonna pull up all 226 listings that UL have in their directory. Now, UL is one of multiple laboratories like Intertech that might also have ASTM E2307 testing. In this case, we're gonna focus on UL, but you can see on the left, you can search by manufacturer, you can search by joint width, ratings, L ratings, uh, and even keywords. So if you know some of that information, you can try to lower that number down. So if I know I have 3M product, hey, I'm gonna to go to these five listings and I can search through these areas. I can then also uh, scroll down and kind of review them this is the actual listing from the UL website. And if I'd like to have it, I can email it or print it to myself, as you see on the screen here. So uh, kind of an easy exercise. You just need to sign up for a free account. And this UL Product IQ is the place to go to. Uh, I save this uh, location and I use it often in my consulting job. So uh, that's kind of the resource that we'll start with. So you have that as an option. Back to today's exercise, though, I already pre-plugged one of these in. And I'm going to go with a listing called CWD. 1017. Well, the nomenclature, there's a whole different educational program on that, but that's going to be a curtain wall, dynamic, and a 1000 series system uh, verifies off the joint width size. So what can I find in this information and how do I read them clearly? So a couple things to think about. The listing has its system we just talked about. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the nomenclature, please take a look at your XHDG guide by Underwriters Laboratory. That's going to help you understand the nomenclature of these listings better. The F rating and T ratings and L ratings, other ratings are all provided here at the top of the page like other listings we're used to. A couple things to remember. The focus of our code is to look for an F rating to match the floor we're working with. Uh, the linear joint width gives us a four inch max. So that's nice to know our limitations. L ratings, again, if we have smoke barriers, we're looking for that. And it does talk about movement. Uh, perimeter containment's a little bit unique because it does talk about vertical or horizontal shear, not so much a compression or extension like you see in an interior rated joint. Like with all listings uh, from UL, we do get a generic or an isometric drawing as we see here to kind of help point us in the right direction with specific callouts that can help us uh, identify more specific information. Uh, please remember, with all listings in Firestop, this is a generic representation of one condition. We have to read the verbiage to fully understand the overall listing and what is acceptable. So this doesn't show me a lot of different elements. So a couple of things to think about uh, as we move forward. I want to point out and break out each specific condition. First, we talk about the floor thickness. Uh, this is usually measured from the area uh, at the face of the floor. So if you have a bent plate, uh, sometimes that's thicker than the decking behind it. So a minimum four inch thick floor we're looking at just to verify our deck edge thickness. Quick measuring tape uh, measurement can be done there. Then we get into the more specific areas. Uh, common things that might be overlooked by your uh, typical designer or installer uh, or even manufacturer is going to be the mounting bracket of the curtain wall itself. So there are all specific elements of the assembly are going to be listed in this listing. I cannot tell you that one is more important than the other. So many people just focus on just the fire stop spray. 
my focus is we're all gonna have equal elements here. We need to check each box off to make sure it 100% matches what I'm looking at in the field or during plan review. So curtain wall mounting bracket. Uh, a couple of things to think about here. I'll go back to the PowerPoint as I back around. This is an example from the outside of a building uh, of a curtain wall assembly with typical spandrel panels, uh, aluminum mullions and transoms and a concrete floor over metal fluted deck. How, how is this assembly attached to the floor? Remember the floor is rated, the facade is not. So a basic step we wanna think about asking ourselves early in the job is how does it attach? These are some examples of mounting brackets. Many times we see them attached to the top of the floor. On the left side of the screen, you see an example of a face mounted and then also an undermounted potential uh, mounting bracket. All different ways. I've seen it even on uh, below the floor uh, off of beams and other elements. So figuring out what this is and then going back to the system is gonna be a good first step. This system talks about a specific size uh, uh, mounting bracket. It even talks about where it should be attached to. So gives me a good amount of measurements to take a look at. Uh, it does point a few elements out though that's gonna make me understand if I'm in the right direction or not right away, is it does say secure to top of floor. So again, if I have an undermounted bracket to the underside of the floor, I already have a rejection of a listing being acceptable to match that specific condition and might need to speak further with my design professional, consultant, or fire stop manufacturer. So again, it gives us all the specifics that's gonna go into that mounting bracket, how it's made, how it's attached, and where it's attached. If you remember from the drawing, it did look like it gave us a generic example or representation, pretty more than generic, but it does show a good overview of section 2A you can see there. And if I go back down to 2A, that was the area I'm at. It then also provides an option. So again, just because it only shows one condition, this does allow a Halfen-based anchor. So multiple types of brackets may be allowed. We have to read through the listing and understand where they can go and how they're built. The framing is going to talk about the overall assembly. So if I go back to that photo I had before, a couple key terminology I want to make sure we take home from this is not all curtain wall assemblies are made in this type of construction, but a common terminology is mullions, meaning the vertical aluminum element here is called a mullion. And as you can see, it goes, it's repetitive throughout the building with different spacings as well as a transom. So the transom is the horizontal element here we see, the horizontal aluminum going across. So understanding that spacing is an imperative step as an inspector uh, or someone selecting a fire stop system. So how wide are the mullions apart? How tall are the transoms from each other vertically? And then how far above and below the floor are those transoms as well? I can't select the listing properly without knowing that information. And as many of us know, throughout the building, it's not going to be a rectangle that's the same all throughout the building. It's going to have all different shapes and sizes, uh, most likely on the more unique building we get. So if I go back to that listing, uh, let's just read through what it allows. It will give me a specific size and a width and a depth. It will also even give me a thickness of the aluminum. So again, understanding, we need the curtain wall shop drawings to understand what's allowed. Uh, the mullions, the vertical element, are spaced max 60 inches on center. So no wider than 60 inches. Now this sounds simple, but uh, as someone who does a lot of curtain wall fire stopping design, we see design professionals really trying to expand that region and we might see over 60 inches. So again, over 60 inches, not compliant. Then it talks about uh, the transoms. It will say the interior face of mullions to be a max four inches from edge of floor assembly. Okay, that was our joint we talked about at the top of the page. Transoms to be spaced a minimum 24 inches on center. So again, that means we can have no more than 60 inches across, 24 inches tall as a minimum on the transom space. And so they at least have to be 24 inches. So we see a lot of floor to ceiling windows being designed now. Well, this listing would not allow that floor to ceiling window if the transom to transom spacing is less than 24 inches. So I see 10 inches, 12 inches, some very shallow transom spacing. The minimum height of the top of the floor to the bottom of the vision panel sill is zero. So this allows the transom to sit right here at the in line with the floor line. So a very unique option, which is very user friendly to a design professional to allow lots of glass, lots of window and visible space. But you see there are limitations. On top of that, well, Brent, if the window the transom's higher, isn't that better? I'm getting more protection. Well, you can see the maximum height of top of floor to the bottom of the transom is three inches. 
So yes, this allows the transom to be at the floor line, but no higher than three inches above the floor. More than that, different listings. So you can see how specific how the window system is built relates back to the fire stop listing. So then we have to verify what our exterior facade is made out of. We see glass like vision panels, uh, aluminum sometimes, a spandrel panel is usually the glass, the opaque glass we cannot see through. So I had to verify what my facade would be. A vision panel would be the glass that we can see through. So a spandrel panel, usually can't see through it. Vision, we uh, can. Uh, aluminum and different types of uh, elements are shown here. If I have a back pan or a shadow box, we're seeing more of that in design these days. I don't see that listed here. Might not be acceptable. So the type of facade needs to be called out. Then we finally get to the insulation. So this is the curtain wall insulation, which would be the primary element within the spandrel panel. So if I go back to this drawing, we usually only focus our fire protection from the top, the transom above the floor to the transom below. So this is where our fire zone or that insulation primarily is applied per the listing. You may see insulation above and below this, but it might not most likely be required per the listing to be attached the same way. So we have to verify that within the listing as well. So a minimum two inch thick mineral bat insulation faced on one side with aluminum foil scrim. Impasse horizontal angle and hangers to install the insulation bat six inches from each mullion end and spaced max 16 inches on center across the window sill. So now we're getting pretty specific. It talks about a specific type of product, minimum two inch thick fire span 90. So that's a specific thermofiber Owens Corning eight pound density curtain wall insulation, the fire span 90. They have fire span 40. Roxel, uh, Rockwell, IIG, other manufacturers also have similar type materials, but this listing is proprietary to that specific product unless the listing tells me otherwise. So I need to verify the type of insulation, the thickness of insulation, the density, and to make sure even the part number potentially matches up with what I'm looking at. So this listing again, contractor likes brand X, doesn't mean it's gonna work for every listing. We can get into how the insulation is attached. Now this listing is very unique because it's focused primarily on a proprietary product called an impasse hanger, which is made by Owens Corning Thermofiber and it's only to their listings. Many listings will give you multiple options. Uh, this one is specific only to using an impasse hanger. So what I'm trying to stress here is, well, Brent, I love that impasse clip. It really saves me a lot of time and money. I always use it. Well, the listing needs to specify the attachment method you are going to use. So when I go to a different listing, it might talk about an impaling pin or a perimeter angle. That is not what I'm looking at on the screen right now. Just like this cannot use a perimeter angle or an impaling pin for this listing. So verifying the type of attachment method of our insulation is also an imperative step. So if I zoom out of my drawing here, these are common uh, examples where we see elements like an impaling pin, which is this element here to pin the insulation mechanically to these angles. We also see stiffener tees or hat channels to support the insulation at the floor line. You can see in both of these examples, there's what's called a stiffener. That's usually a few inches down or middle line of our safing in the floor line. So we're going to kind of talk about that as well. And you can see the mounting bracket, when it's a face mount, it could conflict or get in the way of some of those required elements. So again, one thing to note is these impaling pins, as you see here, uh, I'm seeing a screw to the mullion and I'm seeing a screw to the angle. I'm not seeing any epoxy or glue or any sort of stick in this case. So please read the fine print of the attachment method because the majority of the time, we're gonna be screwing, fastening, or attaching mechanically to this non-rated facade. So this requires an uh, impasse clip. It gives me a certain on-center spacing of where they should go. It tells me a specific how many times they might have to go. In this case, only one impasse clip has to go in the vertical element because we have such a shallow potential height. Uh, it says, let's see, one impasse hanger is to be installed both in the vertical mullion sides of the insulation at six inches up from the bottom of the insulation bat. So it's exactly where to go, pretty straightforward not very open to a lot of different options potentially for your project. So again, assuming the product holds the rating or it can just be used as I please around elements is not gonna help us, we're following the listing. 
Impasse hangers are screw attached. So again, I don't see the word stick or epoxy or fast, uh, adhesive to the top transom. Impasse vertical hangers are screwed to the vertical mullions. And it even tells me on what specific fastener I need to use. On the lower transom, hey, no attachments required in that lower horizontal transom below the floor. So again, some listings might not require all four sides. So then the curtain wall insulation, it goes back to the specific of the Firespan 90 product. Nominal two inch, we're seeing three, four inch products used often to help with R values. Uh, it talks about minimum sizes, so I can't just cut a bunch of pieces. Uh, we usually will talk about vertical and horizontal seams. If we have a vertical seam or a horizontal seam, it's usually gonna be defined in a listing. So vertical seams are usually a very big no-no. Uh, within this installation, it should be pre-cut, pre-manufactured exactly for your project. Uh, if I ever see a vertical tape line, a vertical seam, big red flag. Horizontal seams are usually only going to come into play if I have a stiffener uh, at the floor line like I showed you where we see a horizontal seam. It needs to be called out within the listing. So this one is a pretty specific size opening allowance. Um, it then talks about also how the insulation and mullion covers are going to be held in place. So this talks about that the mullions need to be protected as well. So what does that mean? If I go back to my drawing, we looked at a couple different examples of the attachment method. I'm now showing you that the insulation once installed, this is from the outside of the building, kind of looking at an example, using perimeter angle, and I can see all my screw patterns. Uh, and then the insulation from the inboard side would also potentially have a mullion cover when we finish. An example of a mullion cover as shown here is where the vertical elements are we might need an additional piece of curtain wall insulation to protect the mullions themselves so you can see the steps are the angles insulation you can even see kind of the the uh, clinch pin here to hold that uh, impelling pin in place that insulation in place the mineral wool and safing goes in the floor line and then the mullion cover so we had kind of got ahead of ourselves with that photo but again, it gives me specific sizes. It talks about how wide, minimum 12 inch, we need to have that material centered over the mullions and attached with spiral anchors. So specifically, specific type of fastener, specific on center spacing. Again, not, I love that spiral anchor brand. I use it all the time. Well, the listing needs to call out spiral anchor because you'll find many times not acceptable again, proprietary potentially to this manufacturer. Finally, we get to our fire safing and fire stopping in the slab edge. So it took us a good amount of time to get here. We're here now. Talks about our joint distance of max four inches. Nominal four PCF density mineral wool bat insulation. So I'm not using the eight pound density or six pound. I'm specific to this nominal four pound density safing. It tells me how to cut it. it. Tells me the compression ratio, which you can learn to calculate for the UL guide as well but it gives me a certain width greater than the opening. I need to compress and into it. It even tells me which way the grains are going to the opening. So again, the orientation of the grains are imperative. We always want to see them parallel to the floor, compressed from the floor to the facade running parallel for the compression of that. And they're installed flush with the top of floor. Again, gives me a specific four pound density product. Finally, we get to the fire stop material. In this case, it gives me a few options. Minimum eighth of an inch wet thickness and sixteenth of an inch dry. So if we're inspecting destructively, it actually does the calculation of the shrinkage value for me. Measuring wet, I have a gauge to go off of with maybe a wet film gauge. Talks about overlaps. Minimum half inch onto the top surface of the floor and the curtain wall insulation and mullion covers. So you can see in my photo before, it looked like that listing allowed the spray to be done before the mullion covers. This one looks like the spray needs to overlap onto the mullion covers. So again, it talks about different products that can be used, even different thicknesses of the spray, depending on which fire stop product used by the same manufacturer. It also even allows an alternative option. In this case, this manufacturer has a tape apply product with different overlapping and installation instructions and, and procedures. So a listing is not always going to be proprietary to one product, but it could be to one manufacturer as you're seeing here. So we're doing just Owens Corning thermofiber insulation and just 3M fire stopping materials. So with that, I hope you understand how much can go into one of these listings. This is one of hundreds of examples that are out there. Uh, you can see how complex there are even more, much more complex listings than that. But the questions we should be asking ourselves is, how is the attachment done of the curtain wall to the floor? How is the measurements of the mullions and transoms and their spacing going on?
How is my insulation attached? How, what is the insulation? Does it match? What about mullion covers? How are they attached? What materials? What's the compression ratio of our mineral wool and safing? What's the fire stopping materials and thicknesses and overlap? So lots of questions go into just one listing that we could see used over and over again. If you're looking to learn more about other types of listed fire stop systems, take a look at firestop.org. The International Fire Stop Council has a video series like this of other topics. Additionally, if you wanna learn more about fire stop as a whole, please take a look at their website. There's a large amount of free information found on firestop.org, uh, examinations for inspectors, a free reading list to really educate all individuals within this industry. Or feel free to reach out myself, Brent Johnson at Firewise Consultants, and we wanna thank you for taking the time to attending this video. Thank you.